Well, there you go, folks. Starting off without the back office, it, it is an, another example of how on earth I get by from day to day. I'm going to just make sure that you can see me and hear me in there. So I'm going to look. Hey, there it goes. It sounds like uh, Emma Lukerman. Thanks for uh, weighing in. And uh, is, is, is Adora Smith, uh, you, you weren't going deaf. I'm just showing that I'm an idiot at times and that I can't function without the back office very well. So it is so great to be with all of you. And I'm really looking forward to this discussion tonight. I don't do lives very often anymore. I think you've noticed that. And I am just really stoked about getting on tonight. I, I just ran in from a meeting. In fact, uh, let's see if I can loosen the tie a little bit and relax a little. Um, <clears throat> Eliza Fletcher really captivated me when I saw this case unfolding for a couple of reasons. One is I, I worked with the Memphis Police Department for a number of years. I helped in some analytical functions within the real-time crime center there. Uh, I, the former chief is a longtime friend of mine, and we continue today to be very close. In fact, I hired the chief's brother to work at another real-time crime center, and uh, and I love the ribs and I love the music. So uh, it's it's great to to be talking Memphis, but not about a subject like tonight. This one has really captured a lot of attention, and uh, and tonight I. I wanted to try something different. If you caught my video with Adventures with Purpose a few days ago, I thought I'm going to, I've been thinking a lot about this true crime community that I've been a part of now with you for a couple of years. Uh, we have grown at a steady rate and I find myself continually asking, am I doing the right thing by getting on and talking about these cold cases and sharing some of the behavioral principles that a profiler would apply to these cases, and frankly, uh, talking about the cases from a cop's perspective. I hope it's been entertaining, but I'm really not interested in entertaining you. I'm, I'm hoping that somehow I'm getting across some of the principles that might help reduce our risk and the risk of our loved ones. And, uh, and that's really where my primary focus is. And uh, as I've been thinking about that, I came up with this new concept called return to the classroom. And it's a way for me to maybe examine these cases from a higher level and then talk about some of the principles, the behavioral principles that I see in the suspects and the suspectology, the things that really get the motor running in these predators. And talk about the victimology or what it is that makes us victims. And can we do anything to minimize our risks of being victimized? So if you watched my video on Kylie Rodney, I uh, talked with the Adventures with Purpose teams who I have uh, uh, worked with a lot over the last couple of years. In fact, have worked on a number of cases with them where I've been out with them on dives and I've provided them investigative support on a number of cases. This year alone, uh, I am so honored to be able to say I provided investigative support and geographic support using maps to identify locations that I think the team should search. And we've been fortunate in locating three dead bodies, uh, bringing some closure to those families. Kylie, uh, was a was a really interesting case, and I hope you'll go back and watch that video on Kylie. It's just uh, from a couple of days ago, where we talk about the risk factors and the case overall. I did this as my launch to this idea, return to the classroom, and uh, I wanted to do things a little differently. And I promised you Annie Elise, and Annie's going to get on with me, but I I wanted to do this thing a little bit differently. I've got a 20-minute video on Eliza Fletcher that I'm going to play right now. I was just going to post that today, and I thought maybe this would be more valuable to all of you if I did it in conjunction with a live. And so that's what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to play this short video, and then Annie's going to join me. We're going to talk a little bit and answer your questions and uh, just, just have a, a frank discussion. And folks, I want to preface this by saying I'm not victim blaming, but I want to talk 
and get really down in the trenches and talk about these cases from a little different angle than maybe a lot of folks are uh, talking about them. So with that, let's uh, let's watch this together and uh, we'll come right back. A low risk mother of two suddenly becomes the victim of a vicious assault and murder. And now everybody's wondering how something like this can happen. Turning now to breaking news and the investigation of that missing Memphis jogger and mother of two, Police confirmed today the body of 34-year-old Eliza Fletcher has been identified, but the cause and manner of death are still unknown. Here's NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirsch with the latest. Breaking news out of Memphis, Tennessee. Police say they have found the remains of Eliza Fletcher. The mother of two had been missing since early Friday morning when authorities say she disappeared in the middle of her morning run. And we now know, unfortunately, that a woman described as a beloved teacher as well as an active member of her church has been found dead. According to police, the man accused of abducting Fletcher, Cleotha Abstin, now faces additional charges, including first-degree murder and first-degree murder in perpetration of kidnapping. Late yesterday, police said they had found an unidentified body in an area that was being searched. We know now from police because they were still in the process of investigating the disappearance of Eliza Fletcher. According to an affidavit, that area is not far from where the suspect, Cleotha Abstin, allegedly was seen cleaning out the inside of the SUV used in this abduction with floor cleaner and a place where he was seen washing his clothes in a sink. We now know that body was that of 34-year-old Eliza Fletcher, the granddaughter of a local hardware store magnate her disappearance, and now her death, leaving this community reeling. The suspect who appeared before a judge earlier today is now expected back in court tomorrow. Let's examine how a predator exploits our weaknesses and capitalizes on our poor choices. This isn't victim blaming, folks. This is the profiling evil classroom. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Profiling Evil's Return to the Classroom. You know, for the last two years, I've been wondering about this crime and true crime environment and how talking about these true crimes can make any kind of difference in the lives of people. It struck me that we're missing the harsh realities of how our choices can increase our risk of becoming victims of crime. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk a little bit about this. We're going to explore a little deeper. I hope you'll take a moment, hit that like and subscribe button and ring the bell. That way you're going to get all of our notifications on videos like this one. Now, it was just a few days ago, September 2nd, Friday morning at about four o'clock in the morning, when a Memphis mother of two, Eliza Fletcher, tied on her running shoes and headed out the door for her morning run. It was just like she had habitually done every single morning preceding that. Media reports suggest she ran the same route nearly every single day. What she didn't realize was that a recently paroled violent offender was in the same area and he was hunting for a victim. The alleged predator is an offender who's 38 years old. He has a long rap sheet, which is shocking, given the fact that he spent 20 years of that 38-year lifespan in prison, more than half of his life, for th aggravated crimes, things like kidnapping and robbery and sexual assault. That means the string of violence in his past had to have happened during his youth. If he made it 38 years today, 20 of which were in prison, two that he's been on parole. And that string of violence includes sexual assault, like I said, and that's important in this case, I believe. This guy was paroled from prison in 2020 against the arguments of former law enforcement officers who helped put him behind bars. Now, his victim in that crime from 20 years ago was an attorney who interestingly worked in the same law firm as this victim's uncle. Was there a tie? Some people are saying it's a clue and that there may have been something pointing toward a retaliatory assault. 
in my opinion, that's either a really big assumption by that former FBI agent who brought it up, or she's sharing information that perhaps should have stayed locked inside the investigative vault, held for a different time. But this brings up the first lesson that I want to explore today, victim risk. Now, Eliza Fletcher sounds like an incredible woman, a mother and wife. She, I mean, she comes from a influential and well-to-do family. She was educated. She had a master's degree before becoming a teacher. Now, victims of crime come from all kinds of socioeconomic groups. There are high-risk victims of crime, people like drug dealers or people who get involved in the sex trade industry. When they get victimized, it's generally, according to statistics, by a stranger. And the assault that happens is a crime of opportunity. They happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Well, Eliza Fletcher doesn't appear to be living a high-risk lifestyle. Instead, her days are filled with taking care of a family while balancing her job as an educator. She slips out at 4 o'clock in the morning, probably because it made sense to her and because once everybody else in the family got up and going, there just wouldn't be any time for herself. But the moment she stepped out of that door at 4 o'clock in the morning, alone and often in darkened areas of the city, her risk level shot through the roof. Now you can go back and watch my video on victim risk continuums and how we can look at our lives and reduce our uh, risk of being victimized. I hope you'll take a moment and go back and look at that. But I noticed in the photographs that Eliza was wearing that she wore a sports watch. Now, it could have been tied to her mobile phone, something that would provide her location information and information about her heart rate, pulse, and all of that stuff. But the moment she separated from her phone, which was found at the initial contact site, the place where that assault occurred, finding her then becomes next to impossible. Now, again, let me just reiterate something. I am not victim blaming. What happened to Eliza was a crime, and she is in no way deserving of being a victim. But she was a victim. Her risk level shot through the roof the moment she ran out of her door at 4 a.m. Her risk level shot up the moment she chose to run alone. Her risk level shot up when she chose to run on more scenic streets that gave a little variety, I guess rather than selecting a treadmill or a track inside of the nearby university or a nearby gym. Now, all of that said, again, I want to reiterate that none of this is justification for the predatory assault that she endured. Fletcher was seen on surveillance footage running in a pink top with purple running shorts through the neighborhood. Media reports suggest that she followed her usual route here along Central Avenue, running toward the University of Memphis. While Fletcher is running, another surveillance camera is picking up the suspect's vehicle prowling around the university, near the location where Fletcher is abducted. In fact, Police would later find additional camera footage that showed the predators wearing some champion slip-on shoes near a movie theater just north of the abduction site. Now, what this tells us is that the predator was out and about. But why? One report suggests that he was working nights doing some cleaning services. The other theory mine, and maybe it goes coinciding with the being out working a regular job, is that he's a predator and he was out hunting. He was doing what predators do. Then, 20 minutes into her run, as, as she's passing that area in the 3800 block of Central Avenue, the predator moves into action and he pulls up the street in front of her where she's running toward him. And he waits for her to run past him. Now, as she does run past, he bolts from his vehicle, and in a blitz-style attack, he violently assaults her, and then hauls her over to the passenger door of his vehicle, where he throws her inside the car. Now, this is where things get a little weird, folks, 
because according to reports and CCTV footage, the predator and the victim remain at the, that initial contact site for nearly four minutes. And this causes me to question why. Now, one theory could be that he's continuing to assault her in the vehicle, trying to somehow get better control of her. Remember this. I mean, she is an athlete. And, and when he attacks her, odds are that she was fighting the best she could. Now, he's much bigger. But, but it still would have taken some time to gain control over her and get her compliance. Now, another possibility is that he was uh, checking her, that he had disabled her or that she was compliant and he was checking her for any tracking device, like if she's carrying a mobile phone. Now, I say this because Fletcher's phone was found later by a passerby out on the ground where that initial assault occurred. The predator could have thrown the device out the window after finding it on her. And personally, I think this is less likely because of some behaviors that we're seeing at the scene. Behavior that would suggest that he, again, had a heck of a fight on his hands when he grabbed Fletcher. His organized thinking, all his fantasy, all his planning and preparation suddenly went out the window when this woman started to fight him. It's evidenced by his slip-on shoes being found at the crime scene. And at the end of that four minutes, the predator drives away with his prey secured in the front seat of his vehicle. Now, before I move on, I want to talk about another lesson in this crime. It's called Targets versus Victims of Opportunity. And if you're a member of the Profiling Evil Academy, you can watch those videos and you'll get up-to-date videos as I release them. But remember that I mentioned that the former FBI agent suggested to the media that Fletcher may have been targeted, victimized by this predator with a specific goal of getting her. Keep that in mind for a moment. And, and here's why. The next thing we try to understand in these kinds of crimes is the relationship between the predator and the victim. And there's almost always a relationship. Sometimes the victim doesn't know that relationship exists. In this case, was the predator that stalked Fletcher doing so because he knew she was related to someone who worked in the same law firm as his victim, the same victim that sent him to jail for 20 years? If so, was this guy watching her day after day to determine her daily routines? I mean, this is possible, but I certainly don't think it's probable. I mean, think about this for a moment. That would mean this guy spent 20 years in prison thinking about revenge. Then he spends another two years after he's released from prison, leading up to this assault, planning the murder. A murder against somebody who was just a distant connection, not even related to his victim. It just doesn't make sense to me. But what does make sense is that this offender was traveling from work or he was literally hunting, like I suggested, when he saw Fletcher. He reacted like a predator in the wild, thinking I can ambush and easily get control of this victim. Well, it didn't work out that way, and he ended up with a fight on his hands that not only disoriented him, but it shattered his disgusting fantasies. Hey, by the way, folks, we're talking about the abduction and murder of Memphis mother of two, Eliza Fletcher. You know, I gained a lot of information on this predator in the case by searching Truthfinder. I use Truthfinder every day, and now you can sign up and try it out with Profiling Evil's discount code that's in the description below. You know, you might use Truthfinder to help you locate missing loved ones or to check out that new person that you've met online. Truthfinder is an affiliate of ours, which means that I get a small commission if you sign up. It's about enough to buy you and me a Diet Dr. Pepper. Remember, you can cancel your subscription at any time without penalty, so check it out. Now, once Fletcher was inside this Predator's SUV, it appears that he took her to an abandoned home about seven and a half miles away. It's to the south and to the west. This location, incidentally, was also near his home and the home of his brother. That's important in this case, and here's why. 
There are a lot of locations that this predator could have stopped and dumped Fletcher's body. Police haven't released the cause of her death, and media reports suggest that her body was recovered in a dumpster near her brother's home. I, I don't believe this theory about her body being in the dumpster. I don't think it's correct. I do believe the dumpster contained evidence, those plastic bags that had some clothing and, of course, blood and body fluid that was cleaned up from inside the vehicle. There was also another plastic bag that was recovered away from the dumpster, perhaps fell out of the vehicle while he was transporting it. But I do believe Eliza was taken to a secluded spot where the predator had frequented before, knowing that he could have some privacy there, either to dispose of her body or further assault her before killing her. You can call this a hunch, but I think that this might prove true and perhaps lead to the reasons for the attack. When I look at this guy's criminal history, there are a number of violent assaults, including one that sent him to prison for the 20 years. That one, it was the robbery of that victim who was a man. But there's also a rape charge in his criminal history, and that may explain some of his motivation for this crime. It's going to be interesting to see if the autopsy will prove whether Eliza was alive or dead when she reached that abandoned house where police recovered her body. This imagery shows uh, the home from a Google picture where the grass is all cut. And then this photograph shows where police recovered her body just a few days ago. Uh, and you can see how overgrown it is and how easy it would be to conceal a body there. Remember, there was enough trace evidence in the suspect's vehicle to cause police to theorize days before that she had been the victim of a violent assault. Well, by 1045 on the following day, police arrested Cleotha Abston for the disappearance of Elijah Fletcher. And by the close of Monday, he had been charged with multiple crimes, making his first court appearance today. Now, while Eliza Fletcher didn't deserve to be victimized by this vicious predator, there were actions she took that increased her risk of becoming a victim. These are the lessons that we can learn from. Perhaps it's as simple as changing our daily routines, but I believe the hour of the day, running alone, those kinds of things are the biggest factors that elevated our risks. These are the lessons we can all learn from. Perhaps it's as simple as just changing our daily routines. But in her case, I believe it was the hour of the day and running alone that also were contributing factors elevating her risk. And talking about risk, uh, this topic is risky, folks. So I want to remind you that my purpose is not to cast any blame on Eliza Fletcher or any other victim of a crime. This crime was committed by a violent predator who chose to hurt her for his own satisfaction, whatever that may prove to be. The purpose of this video and of Profiling Evil Return to the Classroom is to examine crimes a little differently, to talk about what we can do to reduce the amount of risk we assume in our daily lives and hopefully influence our loved ones to do the same. Hey, if you found this valuable, hit that like and subscribe button. The Return to the Classroom videos are first made available to our Profiling Evil Academy channel members. A few days after that, we'll release it to the general public. So please consider joining our channel memberships. We really appreciate the financial donation. And remember, you can always donate to Profiling Evil on PayPal. Your financial support helps us continue to roll out quality content. Now, please consider sharing Profiling Evil with your friends and contacts. Tell people about Profiling Evil on your social media outlets and look for us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can get our Profiling Evil podcasts on your favorite podcast platform. And you can learn more about our efforts by visiting our webpage at profilingevil.com. And while you're there, sign up for our free newsletter, The Bolo. It stands for Be On The Lookout, and it's a place where we can send out special content from time to time. Hey, thanks for your support, and we'll see you all soon at the next crime scene. Well, there you go, folks. I'm really interested in what your thoughts are, but I'm most 
interested in bringing on my special guest. And I want to <laughs> say hi to my dear friend, Annie Elise. How are you, Annie? Hi, I'm doing well. How are you? I am doing very well. Thank you. And I can't tell you if you, I don't know if you've been catching any of the chat, but uh, half the group is saying, quit yapping. Where's Annie? The other half <laughs> saying, okay, keep finishing out what your thought process is. No, but, I loved oh, it. I watched your full video. It was, as always, very informative and got me thinking about things differently as well. So thank you for that. Well, I'll tell you what I loved. I mean, you were one of the first out when this thing broke and I always like your insight. And frankly, I, I really like the fact that I look at things like a guy looks at things. I mean, I, I don't ever walk out of uh, Walmart at uh, 11 o'clock at night and scan the parking lot and think, is there danger out there? But, but women do. I mean, yeah. what are your thoughts? It's just, it's really sad. And it's just, the world is getting scarier and scarier. And it's so interesting because just last weekend, I took my son to Target. And that's obviously one of the biggest areas right now for people to abduct children, women and their children. And I was going with him through the toy aisle, like letting him pick one out. And of course he wanted to like literally cruise every single aisle over and over. And I was just like, in my head, the first thought that came to my mind is, I hope nobody's watching us. And I was looking over my shoulder, making sure nobody was following us between the aisles. Then as we were leaving, I had him in the cart and I said to him, like as a reminder, which we always do this, if anybody ever tries to come up to you and take you from mommy and daddy, you scream, right? And I was just like so hyper alert for, with my surroundings. And I'm like, this sucks so bad that this is the world that we're living in. It's just so scary. It's so scary. And it's like, People are desperate for money, desperate for all sorts of things. And you really can't trust anywhere or anyone really anymore. It's very sad. No, isn't that the truth? And, you know, um, I, I like when you when you talk about things from a woman's perspective, but also you've developed a pretty darn keen true crime uh, mindset as well. And uh, you. you and I have been kind of, slated for some pretty cool stuff somewhere down the road that we keep waiting. We'll, we'll roll out the way we, we had hoped, but um, I wondered what your thoughts would be tonight about me tackling something that really rubs the line on saying, well, wait, Eliza Fletcher could have done some things differently and it could have saved her life. What are your thoughts about me taking that approach and about the approach? You know, I think it's I think it's smart and I think it's a different approach than a lot of the people in the true crime community take because I think there is just such a worry of victim shaming or it being perceived as that. But I th absolutely think, and I know you made it clear that that's not what you are doing, I think it's very important to educate people and remind everybody, change the route you're running, wear an air tag on you, have mace with you, all of these things because... I was talking with one of um, the women who helps me with my case research and helps me with my admining and things like that. And she even said, you know, that Liza was very active in true crime and had a high interest. And so she had said to me, she's like, don't you think she would have known to change up her route on her run? I was like, honestly, I don't even change up my route. And like, now I'm thinking about that. Like, I think it's just so important to always be reminding everybody of the dangers out there and things that can and should be done differently so that we can protect ourselves. It's nobody's fault, but the perpetrator, of course, but there are things that we can all do to make sure that we're safeguarding ourselves and our family. Boy, you are, you are uh, so right. And, you know, I think oftentimes when I teach a profiling class, for instance, one of the first things that I do is um, I will uh, take an individual and I'll say, just answer these questions, yes or no. Do you stop at the same coffee shop every morning on your way to work? Do you purchase gasoline at the same gas station every, every time you stop and get it? Do you shop at the same grocery store? We are habitual creatures and that habitual nature that we have can be used against us if we're a target. And again, I, I tossed out this idea of whether Eliza was a target, like, uh, and uh, for instance, an FBI agent's pitching out a theory based on the fact that her uh, uncle worked at the same mm -hmm. law firm as the victim who uh, put this guy in prison. And, uh, or was this a crime of opportunity? And, and I know you've kind of 
teased both ideas as you've <laughs> talked in your videos. So tell me your thoughts today and let's talk about that piece alone for just a moment. So, yeah, I, did, I had wavered back and forth with quite a few different things. Not only those two scenarios being a possibility, but of course, I'm not maybe as logical as you in the sense I'm maybe more of a pessimist by nature. So, of course, my first thought is, could the spouse be involved just because unfortunately <laughs> we go to that. <laughs> and, Absolutely. So, and, you know, there's rumors, of course, going crazy on the Internet about addiction issues, affairs, things like that. We know she, you know, had quite a bit of money coming through via inheritance. So that was one scenario to look at as well. And what was so interesting is there's so many nuances in this case that it really could go down either path. There is that connection at the law firm. There is the possibility of it being random. And then there's some weird stuff if it ends up being true regarding the marriage and a possible separation. But I did some more sleuthing on my end and I actually recorded a video today where I gave my full opinion. It hasn't been posted yet. It's been posted in Patreon. It's going to go live tomorrow. But my opinion has shifted on this and well good we're gonna and we don't want to yeah. we, we want to make sure people watch that video no 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 so, <laughs> <laughs> so i'm gonna leave this alone other than to maybe tease a couple of ideas there uh what so, one is how do you not think about the spouse if we yeah. if we looked at this from a victimology standpoint uh Eliza Fletcher would fit in a low risk victim. This is, this is a person who probably has a very small circle of friends. She does her thing at school. She takes care of her kids, maybe runs them to soccer on Saturday, goes to church on Sunday. She would be what we would consider to be a low risk victim. And statistically low risk victims are not only targets but the person who kills them is known to them. And that that's just after looking at the, you know, when we were doing profiling training and teaching officers around the world profiling, we looked at thousands of cases and this is just the reality. And so how do you not look at someone like those closest when the person is low risk, like um, a Harmony Williams or a Maya Miliete or, Suzanne Morphew. So what are your thoughts? I agree. I think that she didn't seem to be putting herself out there in a public way where there would have been any risk factors. So you would automatically assume that it is connected. And for some reason, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with the case, it rang very true to me with the Jennifer Dulos case out of Connecticut. When I first heard about it, I was like, something just feels like maybe it's a little bit close to home because Something too, which both Eliza and her husband had posted on both of their social media accounts is that they were proudly in recovery. So you also didn't have that risk factor of somebody who's hanging out with the wrong crowd, unless of course there is a backslide, which happens, or somebody who is so impaired while they're out that they're putting themselves in a risky situation. So it's very easy, in my opinion, to look at the people closest to her and the ones who would have the most to gain from her you know, demise ultimately. Yeah. Interesting. Well, thankfully, uh, the Memphis police department engaged quickly. I'm sure that they used the, uh, capabilities of the real time crime center. And I said at the beginning of my video, I actually know that center intimately. I've helped them with technology and known the chief there for many years and worked with them, the former chief, not the current, uh, the current director, but, uh, uh, I, I know the techniques that they applied in this case. And uh, one of the things that obviously quickly changed the case in focus, if we look at it from a victimology standpoint, is we find that there are three things that uh, change a person's risk level who might be low risk. And that's situations, circumstances, and environment. And so I kind of mentioned it in my video, but if we were to look at a, a gauge, the moment this woman laces up her running shoes and goes out the door alone at four o'clock in the morning, her risk level starts to increase. Mm -hmm. The moment she does so alone, it continues to increase. Running in neighborhoods that have lighting and low lighting, et cetera, her risk levels in increase. And so all of a sudden we see these low risk individuals who become high risk and high risk victims are generally assaulted by someone who's a stranger to them 
And it's just opportunistic. They just happen to be at the wrong place at the right time. And then we see these blitz style attacks like we saw in this case. So while I might have initially thought about the husband, unless I thought he was in cahoots with the bad guy, all of a sudden with CCTV and DNA recovered from a suspect's shoes and, and other things, it was pretty clear that this truly was an abduction. Now, could there be a collusion? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think too, to your point, there was, this was very sloppy at the end of the day, which makes it look as though it was not planned. It was not very thoughtful, leaving your slides behind at the crime scene or the abduction scene, but also wearing slides to kidnap somebody to begin with. Like there's just so many things, but then on the other side of it, knowing that she goes for a run at 4 a.m. every morning or, you know, very often. And this person was circling around for 24 minutes at 4 a.m. as though he was almost waiting for this person to pass. That's where I started to think and question things like, how did he know that that, that that is the time that she runs every day, that that's the path? Was he waiting? Is that why he was driving for the 24 minutes until she passed? Why not take another runner who's maybe on the road? But again, as I started doing some more research and putting that video together today, it's making a lot more sense to me because I, he has been known to be in that area before. And so I agree. I think that, you know, there is the cross country dream at cross country team at university of Memphis who has filed complaints with campus police for somebody stalking them in a dark SUV. So I think perhaps he was looking for runners Maybe he thought that it was going to be a student runner that he could overpower and wasn't expecting the struggle that he faced with Liza. I mean, there's a lot of details that I went into. And so my perspective on this has kind of done a 180. Yeah, it it's really interesting. It, you know, I, uh, again, you know, I love cops and, and uh, I defend cops almost all the time unless they really are knuckleheads and do something <laughs> criminal. Um, but I, I was immediately uh, captured by the behavior of this particular suspect. And you think about it, um, the FBI agent, and again, I'm not calling her out. She might actually be right. There might actually be a tie. But like I mentioned in my video, imagine the patience it would take if he spent 20 years hating and planning, and then two more years on parole, hating and planning to take a, a someone who isn't a family member. They're just kind of connected through this really long stretch and assault them because of something he went to prison for. I, Which, I don't find that I, likely. My, me either. Only because like, I see where the connection could be a coincidence, but at the same time, her uncle, uncle Michael has absolutely nothing to do with Kemper, the original victim. Yeah. They worked at the same law firm, but to my knowledge, he's not the one who can be, or, you know, tried the case he wasn't responsible at all. So then for Cleo to have such hatred for somebody who's not even connected to Kemper and then to go to a, a, a you know, a family member who's not even directly uh, with the, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. Uh, um, well, I think we agree on that. Now I'm going to add another piece to this behaviorally. And you mentioned it, who, who shows up to an abduction wearing flip flops and, uh, and, uh, you know, when I was a kid, we called them thongs, but that gets you in trouble now saying the guy was wearing his thongs. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, you, you don't go planning an ad abduction in, in something that you're not going to be successful at, especially if you spent two years fantasizing and preparing for this. So that, again, takes me more to this. Uh, disorganized thought process, hunting for a victim. Who cares what the victim is? It might, might have been an open car that he could have stolen money out of or something like that. But all of a sudden, he grabs hold of Eliza and he's got a tiger by the tail. And I think that just completely disoriented him because it didn't go at all like he had hoped. I agree with you. And I think that that also explains why there was no activity for those four minutes once he got her inside the vehicle, because I believe she was fighting back. I think if it were planned, he would know that somebody 
it may have been a risk that somebody may have seen the actual abduction take place and that he would have to haul ass out of there in the car. So to stay for four minutes is a long time. I think it's because he was trying to gain control of the situation. Yeah. Well, this one's going to be really interesting to see unfold. I don't know if you have any questions for me, but I think we ought to just maybe answer a few questions from folks. Is there anything you've seen in there that you've really wanted to grab hold on and talk about? Otherwise I'll do a little Uh, surfing here. I'm going to even put on my... Yeah, I do some do surfing, but while stuff. while you're surfing, I do have a question for you because okay. you'll be the one to answer this for me. <laughs> um, actually, I have two questions for you. So one is obviously we know it's now first degree murder and that there, w- and I believe that that, you know, implies premeditation. At first I had thought that that four minute struggle when she was fighting back, that maybe the death was, and the murder was accidental because he was trying to subdue her and then you know, it ended up in a homicide rather than maybe a sexual assault, which is maybe what he wanted initially. But then with the premeditation, I'm just curious, do you, with that first degree, do you think that he went with the intention of murdering her or just abducting her and doing what he wanted to do? Yeah. So, so the, the interesting thing that I find myself waffling back and forth on is if this were an abduction related to the earlier conviction, you could perhaps theorize that it was a revenge event. Now, sometimes offenders, when they're committing a violent uh, physical assault, will get aroused and then it becomes a sexual assault. And, And so what may start off as being something that that was never even a plan could evolve into, into that kind of a assault. Um, the thing that's so interesting about this case to me, and the thing that kind of talks and speaks premeditation to the abduction which resulted in the murder, which makes it possible to say this was premeditated and he should have known that his actions could likely cause death, is that, do you remember that part where they said video showed that he pulled ahead of her and mm-hmm. then waited for her? And I mm-hmm. often uh, think of, predators on the street like predators in the wild. And I've studied a lot the actions of predators in the wild. And you can tell when a a, a animal happens to stumble across something that they can quickly take as prey versus something that they stalk. And what it would appear is that if this was opportunistic, he drove by, had the thought, pulled over, waited for her to reach him, before going out and then conducting this blitz style attack. And then in the course of committing a felony, he, it results in her death. Now, whether that death occurred at the scene uh, where she's abducted and in the vehicle while he's trying to control her, or if it occurs somewhere along that route, because it looks like there's, you know, close to an hour that, that mm-hmm. he has this victim in his vehicle before he dumps the body was the body taken to the home and assaulted or murdered or was she dead before and he's driving around and you think about when you were a child you know with if things didn't go right when you were playing a game you'd yell do over and we see criminals kind of behaviorally saying i got to do a do over i got to figure out how i'm going to fix all this cuz i never intended it to go this far but now i'm in trouble uh, and then he's trying to figure out where to dump the body so I think as we learn more about this, as the rest affidavit shows more detail or more information leaks out, we might start to get a glimpse into what the mindset was and the motivation. But I don't believe, I've been wrong so many times in my life, I don't even care care to guess anymore, but I don't believe it was motivated by revenge. I I believe it was an opportunistic abduction that uh, just getting a hold of her and stealing her iPhone wasn't the intent. And that uh, probably because he'd been to prison, he didn't want to go back. And so the only way to ensure that is to make sure that there's no witness. That You literally took the words out of my mouth and that exact sentence is in my video that I'm going to be publishing. I'm glad that we're thinking alike, Mike. I appreciate that. <laughs> oh boy. I, I don't know. You know, uh, and so you look at this thing and you think about <clears throat> Um, the cases it unfolds, and then the amount of effort that he 
uh, goes to to start to clean up. And and I thought there were some, uh, again, this is part of this challenge that we face on the true crime community, I think, about trying to get out something. And you, you know me, I'm always erring on the side of I'm going to wait till something authoritative comes out. Uh, we, we saw people saying, oh, there were body parts in bags put in dumpsters and and, uh, and and then you hear the the story evolve to know the dumpster included stuff that was used to clean up the inside of the vehicle and at another location that her jogging trunks were found in a different bag. And how did that originate there? Did it fall out of the vehicle as he was loading it or did it fall out driving back to his brother's residence and to the dumpsters? Uh, and so that's where, from a, a criminal investigative perspective, you start to piece together what what was happening. Because, you know, I don't know that it matters to most people that one bag dropped in one location and something else ended up in a dumpster. But to a profiler, that that's telling me so much about this offender's personality, about their experience level, about what's going on in their mind and how they're trying to get that do-over moment. I agree. When I was putting everything together, I mapped out all of the locations and the the route that I believe he took when he dropped the clothes. I call, I called the same thing out to him. Like the fact that the shorts were found at a different scene near the site of where the remains were left and near the brother's house. But every, the other clothing was left in the dumpster at the McDonald's, which is a 20 minute drive away. It made me think that he after dumping her, went to dispose of the clothing, must have forgotten the piece behind because I can't imagine that he would go, he would like risk driving with all the blood everywhere with, before cleaning up himself. Like, so I broke it all down because I was trying to make sense of that too. I was like, and I was trying to get the timeline in order too, because we only have a few markers that have been confirmed by law enforcement, whether she was seen on camera or he was seen on camera. So I'm happy I was able to make more sense of it. And I go into further detail on that video, but I agree. It's it's interesting when you start to look at those pieces because broken apart, it does become very important. And those things do matter to me as well. And I'm not even a profiler, obviously. <laughs> no, this is so fun. I uh, I really appreciate that. And uh, I can't wait for your video to come out. And folks, by the way, I'm talking to Annie Elise from 10 to Life. I don't know that there's anybody out there that hasn't subscribed to Annie's channel, but if oh, you haven't, please go <laughs> over you. and subscribe. Uh, we have had a friendship for two years now mm -hmm. uh, since I started this true crime. One of the first people I reached out to was Annie, and and uh, I uh, we have talked on so many occasions about criminal cases and shared thoughts and asked for each other's insights. Um, Annie, what what? is big in your life right now. I mean, I know you had just wonderfully great news throughout the year and you can share or not share and you probably have more of that, but, uh, what, what's, uh, what's life like for you right now? It's busy. It's so busy. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm, my life is, hasn't changed much. It's still working full time, doing this full time. Um, two babies, a three-year-old and a one-year-old and, everything in between. So that's life. It's just a tornado every day. <laughs> that's it. So exciting. Nonetheless, I can't complain, but it's exhausting. It's exhausting. That is awesome. I want to, you know, I've, I've missed a few people who have been kind enough to, to uh, do some super chats and thank you. And I've missed so many comments and, and oh, this yeah, is where I really miss comments. the back office because I, uh, I don't have glasses on, and uh, so sometimes I miss some of these things. But uh, did you see any questions that you saw that we ought to just answer? Or You know what? I don't have the chat box up on my end, but let me look right now because I do have it on my phone. So let me just kind of scroll through here, and I'll... And this is interesting. I'd love to see what people think. I think that, uh, that sexual assault was a goal, and they couldn't leave a living victim. Mm -hmm. and uh, And that's really interesting. You know, it takes me back to her jogging shorts, Annie being found near the scene in a separate bag. And again, if this were a, um, a vengeful or revengeful act, would there be a need to remove those unless you're trying to avoid identity um, and having someone identified? But uh, it doesn't sound like there were things that 
uh, happened to her body that would have made it impossible for people to identify her. So I find that to be really peculiar because that speaks to what some of the motivation may have been in this particular crime. I agree. Although I know we haven't heard cause of death yet. And I know the identification took, you know, 18 hours or whatever it was, which is pretty standard. They have to go through their process. I understand. I did hear rumors about certain conditions of the body, which I don't, I won't share just because I don't know if it's true or not, but I, I am going to be curious once we do hear that because it's, while it seems very sloppy, it does seem like there was some sort of hurdle in figuring out if this was in fact her right away. And um, I'm not sure why that was because it was so quickly after she was abducted that obviously, you know, she, you would assume that she would be able to be recognized fairly quickly. Yeah. You know, um, from a forensic uh, point of view, tax law on you, four minutes is a long time staying on the scene. Her fight surprised him. He couldn't stop his thoughts and went out, uh, stalked her and, and uh, on and on. This is something that I think is really important about that four minutes. I, we've had ha- some who have suggested, well, maybe the uh, an, a, a sexual assault was occurring inside the vehicle at that time. Others suggesting that that was a time in which he was uh, trying to gain control of her. Uh, it, it is uh, really difficult when you examine these kinds of cases and, and try to theorize based on limited information. But one other option that I would suggest here is there was a tip sent when law enforcement initially filed a kidnapping and an evidentiary destruction uh, charge that they mentioned that she had been, uh, I can't remember the exact terminology, but they, they said this, this woman has been viciously assaulted based on the evidence that we're recovering. So it makes me wonder if, if she wasn't uh, killed inside that vehicle at that time, either as he's trying to get a hold of her, or get control of her. Cause that four minutes, um, she, she would have been a, uh, a, a, a fighting uh, machine even in there if she was still conscious and uh, and to spend four minutes there is troubling and and frankly having uh, witnessed murders and and I've witnessed murders based on prison tapes where other inmates have murdered other inmates where it was captured on video but uh, it, it's not easy to kill somebody it takes time and uh, that four minutes can disappear pretty quickly in the course of a, a brutal assault. So it'll be interesting to see what that initial blitz was, whether it was sharp instrument uh, assault, whether it was blunt force trauma, whether it was uh, ligature strangulation, whatever it may turn out to be is going to tell us a lot. But I suspect that it's going to be the initial stages were probably more blunt force because of that blitz style attack he did and the fact that it just wasn't going like he wanted it to. I agree. I think too, just be due to the volume of blood on the passenger side, which you see in the footage, he spends all of his time cleaning that passenger side. It be, that's where the majority of the blood was that he was trying to get out of the flooring. So it's my belief that to your point, he drug her in from that side. And then that's where, you know, whether it was the murder itself or blunt force, whatever it was, that's, I believe, where the outpouring of blood was because we see that that's where he spent his time and the focus of cleaning the vehicle. Yeah. Well, uh, did you get a chance to look through any of those, yeah, Annie? We probably said- have time for two more questions and then we can, because uh, I promised you and I promised my mother <laughs> oh, I'm so check sorry on to her hear before too late. I am very sorry to hear about your mother, Mike. <laughs> well, uh, she's she's lived a long, full life. And uh, she, by the way, she told me today, she pulled me down really close to her face. And she said, I didn't realize how bald you were. So apparently <laughs> she's getting more comfortable just saying what she really thinks. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Hey, she hasn't lost her wit. I love that. Um, a lot of these are just more statements rather than questions. But let me see if I can find one. Oh, here we go. How did he grab her, though, if she's a marathon runner? Do you think, do you all think he hit her with his vehicle or had a stun gun? Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I, I personally, I, number one, he didn't hit her with the vehicle, according to the CCTV and, and the media reports and law enforcement reports, unless there's something that they're not sharing there. And 
uh, I don't think he's sophisticated enough to have been approaching with a stun gun. I think it was a blitz style of physical assault. I agree. I think especially because they said that it was a violent attack and that there was a struggle. If he used a stun gun on her or something like that, she wouldn't be fighting as hard. She would be, you know, not like lifeless, but like frail to the point to where I don't think that they would have had such a heavy struggle on their hands. Yeah, that's a, that's hands, a great question, say. though. Um, let's see. Let's go. Such a sloppy abduction. The public and here, here's one on the screen. I don't know if from serial oh. killer. <laughs> uh, I think I'd change that one if I if it were me. But uh, <laughs> he didn't have any type of uh, face covering or mask on. Again, I think when you see things like that, folks, it kind of leans toward the opportunistic and disorganized mindset versus someone who really is planning out their assault. And, and I guess that's why I see myself, I keep leaning uh, more toward uh, this is just a, a predator looking for a victim. Mm -hmm. it, it was just very, yeah, very sloppy. Let's see what we had here. Um, crazy. She couldn't unwrap, un outrun his sandals. Oh, the garden shears. That is a great question. So we saw right at, before they even had arrested him or found any of the evidence, we saw that, you know, law enforcement went to the home and seized the vehicle, some of the tech and the gardening shears. What are your thoughts just being in the field as to, the, the shears weren't bagged or anything like that, I want to mention, but what are your thoughts of them seizing such a specific item? So sometimes you just take everything because you don't want to be that investigator that left the smoking gun sitting on the porch, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so sometimes it's just prudent to take things and look for whatever uh, physical evidence you might be able to, or forensic evidence that you might be able to recover from it. There are always more things collected than provide or yield evidence. And so uh, probably just a smart thing. Now, could it be because there were um, sharp instrument injuries and that was a concern? You know, those those are the kinds of things we don't know and we would just be speculating on. What is your thought on that? I on it. Well, so this was before they found her body, before they found Cleo, I believe even before they identified any DNA um, on those slides. It was right after she was reported as missing and they went directly to the house. They took the family vehicle. They took the computer they and they took the big gardening shears and so i think that also you know aided in the thought that okay they're looking into the husband possibly why else would they take the family vehicle which and i know it is normal in a lot of cases you want to seize everything especially the tech because that's going to give you the latest communication you know anybody she's been in contact with things like that but the gardening shears threw me for a loop as well especially because they weren't bagged as evidence but then I was thinking, okay, were they the landscaper's shears that, that somebody had left behind and not there? So were they lifting those to get a print, but they didn't bag it? Like, I didn't know. Yeah. That's, I really don't is, know. This is interesting. Uh, this is going to be a, this is going to be an interesting case to see unfold. Mm -hmm. And we're going to learn a lot more. And especially when we hear uh, what his defense will be once this reaches, we're, we're going to have uh, a prosecutor that's going to have to decide whether he, tries to pursue a death penalty. And if so, he's got to have a lot of pretty powerful stuff in order to do that uh, and uh, convince a jury that the guy needs to be killed. But you want to talk about an emotional case that you could get a jury involved in. A uh, church-going school teacher who's running and a mom of two uh, is a pretty compelling story of yeah. someone who shouldn't never have fallen victim. You know what? Actually, Mike, I do have one last question for you, and I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this, but I'm, I'm assuming you are. And you just touched on it a bit. So in his last conviction, it, it was stated that 12 months went by after his arrest and he did, he did not enter a plea either way. And that finally they, the guilt, he finally entered the guilty plea, like after some jailhouse bragging or something like that, but to where he hadn't entered one. So they said that he wasn't cooperating with law enforcement back then. They also have been saying that he isn't cooperating now. So I don't know what are the laws and regulations of, is there an amount of time that you have in which you are allotted to where you have to enter a plea one way or another, or how does that work? 
the he's because it's a capital murder case potentially and he's already claimed that he uh will have that he doesn't have the funds to pay for an attorney then the the state of Tennessee is going to pay for his legal fees they'll they'll provide him a public defender who will mm-hmm. at some point enter a plea in his behalf or allow him to enter the plea and i suspect that plea will be not guilty so that they can work on the best deal possible for him and so that they can force the state to show all the evidence that they have, which sometimes then leads someone to say, okay, I, I get it. And I'm going to now negotiate this thing or, or move forward. And then of course, if it goes to a capital murder case, a death penalty case, then uh, the state will continue to pay for that, pay for all the uh, investigators who support the defense, everything else to make sure that this guy is given his uh, legal protection, a lot more protection than Eliza Fletcher got. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I don't know if I phrased my question the right way, so I apologize. But I'm wondering, I, I was always under the impression that at arraignment or whatever that whatever hearing you have to do, you have to enter a plea, whether it's guilty or not guilty, regardless. And what they were alluding to from the previous conviction of his is that he waited 12 months to enter anything and that it only came after the jailhouse oh, oh, conversation. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So yeah. So in that first appearance, usually called an arraignment, uh, they they are given the opportunity to uh, submit a plea. And in a capital murder case like this, where he's been given a, a defense attorney, he's going to probably say not guilty and this thing will move to trial. And how he got away with that before, I don't know. I'll have to do a little studying on that. Maybe the next time you and I get together, we can uh, challenge that one. Or, or we'll grab Scott Reich and bring him on with us and yeah. we'll will uh, say, hey, uh, teach us on that. Yeah, I was uh, chief of staff in the attorney general's office, uh, and uh, and I spent a lot of time uh, with lawyers, but I, I never uh, was one. So I have sometimes I have to say, oh, I, I, don't, no, I, I have I no know. idea. I know, and I never had heard of that. I'm like, I thought you had to enter a plea one way or another. Like, it shocked me. So, yeah, I need to do some digging on that, which maybe your chat is a little – I'm sure they are wiser – than me. So somebody will have the answer. I'll have to circle back in here. That'll be, that'll be fun to, to learn more. So if you yeah. find the answer out, let me know. I will. I will. And Annie, as always, it is just like always one of the highlights of my day when I get to oh, talk to you. you. I'm so grateful that you would jump on. This is kind of a new twist to, to doing things. You know, I post sometimes these videos and if you've noticed, I've gone to shorter videos where I just kind of get concise and and, you know, most of the time people say, oh, you just bore me to tears because all you do is talk about things structurally. But I thought maybe if I did that and then added a little bit of yapping in a live, it might be a fun way to do it. So I'm going to be watching for everyone's comments out there. I hope you'll let me know how you feel about this format. If it works, we might do it again. And Annie, I hope if it works, you'll come back and spend time with me again. Anytime. I love chatting with you. It's We haven't been on here together in so long, it feels like. So I'm happy we were able to reconnect. It has been a long time. Folks, make sure you're subscribing to Tend to Life with Annie Elise. Thank uh, you. I do. I hope you're doing <laughs> it. And of course, I want you all to subscribe to Profiling Evil. It's fun to grow. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a blast to be able to look at these cases, but most importantly, I hope Annie that the stuff we do might uh, cause each of us to think a little bit more about the direction we take in our own risk. Mm-hmm. And if there's a way to reduce our risk or the risk of our loved ones, I hope we're taking advantage of it. And I think we could do a whole lot better job at it than uh, we do. And folks, this isn't about paralyzing you or making it impossible for you to go out and run in the neighborhood or walk from Walmart at night to your car. It's just about being smarter about the things you're doing and uh, doing so a little more safely. So Annie Elise, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I'll talk with you soon. Very good. Thank you. And everybody, thanks so much. Make sure you're subscribing and we'll see you all soon at the next crime scene. Good night. Thank you.